So today's discussion is in partnership with CAF America, ACCP, and Cyber Grants. Joining us is Stacy Palmer, the editor at the Chronicle of Philanthropy, who is serving as our moderator today. And our featured speakers are Ted Hart, CAF America President and CEO, Carolyn Berkowitz, ACCP President and CEO, and Mark Layden, Cyber Grants CEO. And here's some information about our moderator today. A top editor at the Chronicle of Philanthropy since its 1988 inception, Stacy plays an integral role in the various Chronicle services, including its professional development webinar series, Philanthropy Today daily newsletter, and more. And I will now turn this over to Stacy to introduce our speakers and begin the presentation. Thanks so much. Welcome, everyone. We really are glad you're here um, and we urge you to ask questions because we know there are so many of them. We also all collectively want to thank you for the great work you're doing in these very difficult times. Um, this is an extraordinary moment for nonprofits and foundations and corporations um, and pulling together is extraordinarily important. So our deep appreciation for the work that all of you are doing. I'd like to introduce the people who are gonna talk today. And let's start with Ted Hart of CAF America. Ted, can you tell us a little bit about your background for people who don't already know you and also about the research that CAF has been doing all along to really chart what's going on with the response to COVID and so much else? Thank you, Stacy. Since the earliest days of the global pandemic, CAF America has been collecting data and making it available to philanthropists who want to make a difference. For months, we've been surveying over 1,700 global charitable organizations. This has allowed us to tell the stories of unfolding trends amid the disruption and uncertainty of this pandemic. We've learned how nonprofits are working hard to keep their doors open, trying to keep their staff members safe, while still providing life-saving and life-changing services. Along the way, we've had the privilege to be a part of some amazing stories of critical philanthropic support around the world. Many of these stories have involved corporate philanthropy. Time and time again, corporate philanthropy has provided a critical value in informing global response. This new report that we're gonna be sharing with you today highlights how nimble corporate America has been and CAF America has been very privileged to be part of that. Great. Carolyn Berkowitz is another of our speakers. Carolyn, can you introduce yourself, remind people what ACCP is and what you've done before you came to ACCP? Great. Hi, Stacy, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Carolyn Berkowitz, and I am the president and CEO of the Association <clears throat> of Corporate Citizenship Professionals, which is a membership organization for companies who are committed to corporate citizenship and we're a career long resource for um, the professionals serving in CSR roles in those companies. We have about 225 um, companies who share a commitment to social impact, to employee engagement and to community involvement. And you can see then um, the connection with our partners here at CAF, um, at Cyber Grants, and of course at the Chronicle. Um, and, the, and the shared interests that we all have. Um, prior to being um, the CEO of ACCP, which is just about two years now, I led corporate social responsibility for Capital One, which is uh, a Fortune 200 financial services company and um, worked in the trenches leading a team um, who is doing the work of the folks that we are talking about today. And that was a great honor as well. Good. And that it's that expertise that we want to capture as well as what you're doing today. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Mark Layden is our third panelist, and I'm not sure that everybody knows what Cyber Grants is. So if you would tell us a little bit about your background and also about Cyber Grants. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the conversation today. I've been looking forward to this for weeks, and I'm delighted to join my esteemed colleagues in this conversation. Um, you know, it's an important topic, and so it's a good time for us to be talking about this. Uh, Cyber Grants uh, is a uh, software platform that helps primarily large corporations uh, do their corporate social responsibility obligations. So we provide a full range of capabilities from grants to employee engagement programs, to everything from volunteerism to in-kind giving and, and, and all, and many, you know, those sorts of things for hundreds of very large companies and frankly, some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, and so we have a tremendous vantage point, and it's from our vantage point that our 
um, clients like us to you know help them understand what else is going on in the world. So it's it's our privilege and our uh, and our honor to join uh, Ted and Carolyn in this um, in this uh, survey and in the uh, analysis of these results um, to to help uh, everybody understand what's going on. So it's great. Great. I'd be curious from all of your vantage points before we delve into some of the great research and look at the findings, what has been most surprising to you about the corporate response? What really stands out compared to other things that you've seen before? Ted, do you want to start? Yeah, I think uh, just how holistic the, uh, the corporate response has been. Uh, how thoughtful the, the corporations have been in across the entire spectrum of support. Corporations have changed the way that they grant, the speed at which they grant, uh, and their interaction with CAF America as both a domestic and international intermediary. Uh, they've challenged us to change the way that we do business. Uh, to change the way that we interact with charities, uh, to move faster, to get money to charities faster, uh, to shorten the length of time that it takes for an application to be reviewed. Um, so I think the partnership that we have with corporations has made all the difference, uh, particularly with the urgency of this global pandemic. And not just the pandemic, but everything else that we're all dealing everything, with. Everything else Ur urgent right. is the word. <laughs> Carolyn? Oh, you're muted, Carolyn. Muted. Sorry. Um, actually, the point that you just made, Stacy, is um, is really important, and I think that is the thing that has stood out to me. It is not just the pandemic. Um, it is the pandemic. It is the economy. It is um, the the fight for racial justice, and now it is disaster season. And what is I'm not sure it is surprising, but it is certainly heartening is that companies are here for the long haul in this. And so we are seeing, and the research shows this, that um, they didn't use all of their money just for the pandemic. And then they didn't go ahead and use all their money just on the economic recovery. But as each crisis has, um, has become apparent, corporations have been there every step of the way and they are right in the game. They are responding quickly more quickly than some other sectors, um, which which might be um, a, a bit of a surprise to me, but I'm really heartened by the um, by the seriousness with which the corporations are taking their responsibility and commitment and literally covenant with communities. Mark? Yeah, I, I, I can't, uh, uh, you know, agree more. I mean, um, you know, I think I think we were all you know, caught by surprise at some point during the course of this. And, you know, I, I likened it to, to kind of that automobile accident that we all got in. And then all of a sudden we realized we were okay. And we're just, we're trying to hesitate to see what happens, right? Well, I can tell you what happened at our, at our place. All of a sudden in came all the requests for new programs and for changes to programs to make it easier for matching gifts for uh, creative programs. Uh, one of our customers, uh, Dow Chemical created, you know, uh, donated, I think, millions of eight-ounce bottles in order to be able to distribute, um, you know, hand sanitizer. For example. Mm. You know, really interesting things that they've been doing. And so, if anybody thought for a minute that that you know, you know, the American corporations are going to stand down, the corporations in general are going to stand down this during this process, they didn't even hesitate. It happened. Yeah. All the time. So it was pretty. It was pretty, uh, you know, uh, encouraging to, for us. Yeah, and I, I do think the speed is really rather remarkable. Um, one of the things, we've been publishing a number of studies and in each of them, you know, at least two thirds of the response comes from corporations versus foundations and other donors. And when you think about the fact that corporations are a relatively small percentage of giving compared to individuals mm -hmm. um, and foundations, that is more remarkable. And that speed matters to the nonprofits on the ground that really, they need to pay their staffs, they need to do this work right away. Um, right. So, you know, I, I, I hope that continues, but it, mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to note that. Um, Stacy, I just wanted to, to share that 72% uh, of the corporations reported that they increased their giving during this period. Yeah. Uh, and for them to step up in, in that way, as you were just pointing out, really made a big difference for a lot of communities and a lot of nonprofits serving those communities. Great. And I think we can see the slide now that shows that increase, which really is remarkable. 
And it also comes after a year in which companies had already increased their giving, right? That's right. That's right. I think the Giving USA uh, stats said that 11% increase year over year from 2018 to 2019. I think in part due to, as we were talking about earlier, you know, the tax changes, um, but it, could, it couldn't come at a more time, you know, a better time. Uh, the yeah. Already, so it's good. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's really, it's quite striking. So we know they're giving a lot, um, but where are they giving it to? Um, what are you seeing in terms of changes in the kinds of issues that people are paying attention to? Um, I would imagine things like public health are doing pretty well, but what are the other areas that you see companies especially paying attention to? I can take that one. Um, one of the things that, that struck me about this is that all of the folks that we are talking to, so many of them are broadening their issue focus and the, the research shows that. Um, and so when I think about who they are, what they're broadening to or what the new areas of focus are, I would say racial justice is a huge new area of funding. And while um, many had engaged in their core areas of interest, education, healthcare, whatever it is, with the racial justice lens, a new category that is straight up racial justice is emerging in so many companies. So I think about um, a manufacturing company in Ohio who they had a tremendous increase in their giving this year, which will remain in place for next year. And the increase is 100% devoted to a new category, um, which is they call um, racial justice and uh, equality. So that's just one example. I think we've seen um, a, a large increase in concern about mental health, um, which makes which makes good sense. And also in small business um, sustainability uh, and recovery. And I think all of those things m m just make intuitive sense. How about Ted? What have you seen? Yeah, well, what was interesting to us, and I think very heartening, um, is 78% of, uh, of corporations provided immediate uh, relief uh, for the coronavirus, but they also looked at regular projects and, and didn't stop giving to charities in communities that they normally uh, supported and actually turned to those charities uh, to learn what were the stresses that they were facing mm -hmm. um, and didn't turn their back on, on charities and programs that they had already believed in. Um, and I think that was really, really important is that this wasn't taking away from one to give to another but continuing support and caring for what they already cared for, but then finding new ways to support new projects um, of an immediate need. Uh, and I think that was really, really heartening to find that broadening of an interest where charity or corporations in the past may have had a particular focus uh, to their giving suddenly are broadening their, their interest area. Um, and in many cases, tying that, uh, and this is something that, that Mark and I talk a lot about, and certainly uh, Cyber Grants is very much involved with um, here at CAF America, is very much tied to their employees and where their employees uh, work and give. Yeah, I, if I could just jump in, Stacey, I mean, just in support of that point, Ted, um, you know, I think, I think um, you know, among the many really uh, heartening things that, that we saw during this terrible uh, period, uh, you know, certainly there's been broader giving across, across the board, but there's been a, a giant groundswell from the employees in, the, in these companies to participate. And corporations want to align with their employees and make them feel that they're together in this. And, and they certainly come through with that. I, you know, uh, one example that jumps out, with, jumps out to me is, is Morgan Stanley, who immediately following the pandemic crisis, of course, is in New York City, in the heart of Times Square, actually, their offices are. And they, they very you know, rapidly wanted to put up a special program for their employees to participate on in the, um, you know, in, in their case, they, they focused on uh, you know, uh, food insecurity during the pandemic uh, in New York City, which is of course a terrible, terrible issue at the time, but it would be a problem. Um, and we, we were going through that process. And then just as things started to slow down uh, and they were meeting you know, somewhere up in the matching gifts budget, all of a sudden, the questions of the social justice came to the forefront of, mm. of, of America's conscience. And they re-upped the program again, and we switched from 
feeding America to the NAACP, um, uh, Defense Fund, and EGI, and so on. In fact, during that period, we literally went uh, from, you know, 10 times more credit card gifts happened during that period. And, and the, the top uh, not-for-profits that our companies were contributing to went from Feeding America and the Red Cross to, to those other kinds of companies. Really fascinating. But there's really good examples of companies aligning with their employees um, to make contributions in ways that are really meaningful. And is your sense that the companies are asking the employees for recommendations about what groups to support or more issue-based? How, how does that process work? Well, it's both, but, but um, uh, you know, I, I think they're, they're looking for the employees to leave. And I, you know, I think that's a bit of a, a, a shift there. I yeah, I think we've seen that move, uh, you know, from just an advisory role, perhaps on the periphery, uh, to moving more central uh, for a lot of corporations that, that during this period of time, employee involvement has become more central uh, to these discussions. Um, and, and it looks like it has staying power because I think a lot of these corporations um, have looked at this, uh, uh, the success of this and the meaningfulness of this uh, to the, the, their employees, but also to the communities that they're part of and have seen that this has really had a lot of very good staying effect. Carolyn. <laughs> Carolyn. <laughs> I did it again. I think I'm just going to leave it on this time. Um, <laughs> I would add a couple of things to that, actually, um, to both of, uh, of those points that my colleagues made. Um, there are uh, examples of um, employee engagement in the strategy and in the decision making about giving that I think is really important. So the, the first is the new role that employee resource groups um, are playing in helping companies make decisions vetting organizations, vetting issues. Um, and so the employee resource- In case people don't know what an employee resource yeah. is, so yeah. you just explain that. Yeah, so it is um, a network that is, um, you know, sort of um, very often demographically based. So the African-American network or resource group, LGBTQ resource group, women's network, Sometimes it's, it is um, more defined down than that, women in tech resource group, for example. And um, while resource groups were 10 years ago, um, sort of benefits for the sake of engaging and belonging, um, now the employee resource groups are more often being depended on, and we've seen this switch like that in just the last, you know, as this has all happened more often being depended on to inform the company of its strategy mm -hmm. um, and to sort of serve as a lens through which the company can vet issues and organizations. So there have been a lot of recommendations coming directly from these employee resource groups. Um, the other issue that I think is really important and I can point to a, a large media company headquartered in New York who through their matching gift program asked employees um, in response to the racial justice and, and George Floyd tragedy, who, will, who do you want us to match? And so the employees provided their matching and when organizations floated to the top so they would see a critical mass of organizations, they would then look much more closely at that organization and it is under consideration for larger funding now. So while there, there are lots of groups like NAACP Legal Justice Fund where everybody knows about it, there are many, many others that are not household names that are really getting to the forefront of, of the corporate funders uh, priority list because their employees are gathering around those. So I think that's really important for nonprofits to think about is capturing the heart of employees and having them, because the employee voice is so important right now, having them share and influence up inside the company. Yeah, yeah. that's really a huge shift. I mean, it doesn't matter necessarily so much whether you know the CEO, but whether you know the employees, right? That's right. And yeah, in a lot of ways that has believe. changed. That's yeah. right, that really has changed. changed a lot. 
And if you're yes. a nonprofit leader, it's a lot easier to get to know some of those employees than it is to get to know the CEO. So that's that, right. That really so in, democratizes. In, in yeah, and Stacey, if we go to the next uh, next slide, actually, yes. there's a lot of changes that that uh, that have come to uh, to grant making, uh, and uh, you know, one of them is the change of grant purpose for grants that were already out uh, and have, were made to redirect funds uh, to uh, you know, PPE, to uh, immediate needs. Uh, so there's, and uh, in the survey, 65% of corporations uh, redirected funds that had already uh, been made, extending uh, grants beyond the mm -hmm. time frame, mm -hmm. um, but to the point that Carolyn uh, was just uh, was just making, seeing a broadening of giving for for years. There's been a call, and Stacy, certainly you you know this. I see your smile there. Um, you know, operational funding. So many uh, reports and 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 articles about the need for actual operational funding. And and during this pandemic, we start actually seeing uh, a a, a some new funding starting to flow to the actual need for running the operational uh, uh, charitable uh, organization uh, and then need-based uh, funding. So, you know, moving away from, and I think this is, you know, certainly the, the, the special event fundraising, the, you know, the, the gala uh, sponsorship, which a lot of uh, nonprofit uh, organizations sort of, you know, that was their bread and butter and the money would come in and then it would go, you know, to some of the operational funding and things of that sort. Many corporations are, are you know, looking at the actual operation and need-based funding themselves and taking a look at directing those funds. And I think, uh, Carolyn, to your point, the employees are the ones who see those needs Mm -hmm. and, and are actually looking to the corporations to say, you know, they need to pay their rent too. Their employees' right. salaries need to be paid. And I think that uh, in that regard, Mark, uh, employees have a lot of, of say in, in helping these, these charities meet their, their, their budgets. Yeah, I mean, they're in the communities and, and they see the, the work that's being done. And, and I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a recognition that, that our not-for-profits uh, are, you know, in danger. Many of them lost, you know, material amounts of their funding. And so uh, they see that services could go away that are critical to their environment, or oftentimes they're working in the not-for-profits as volunteers as well. So I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think they're the ones that are closest to the ground. Uh, they're voting with their dollars. They're voting with their time. And um, the, the leaders in the corporations are seeing, are taking note of that. I, I think that's a really important point. I do see a question just popped up some folks didn't hear what Carolyn said at the end of the, your last remarks. Um, I don't know whether you can recap that easily. Um, yeah, I, I, we were talking about um, getting to know employees themselves mm -hmm. and, and appealing to that. And I think um, one of the things I, I, I would like to mention, didn't, didn't get a chance to share is um, that there is a deep need now to engage employees around a cause because they, they feel so impassioned about it, yet they can't leave their homes to volunteer. <laughs> yeah. and, so, um, and so what we see is that a lot of uh, companies are turning to, you know, indoor, at-home-based virtual volunteer activities. And while it may feel difficult to, or even a little bit sen senseless for a nonprofit to um, to have to think about what can employees do at home uh, around my organization. It sort of feels like it might not be in a, a priority. I think it is a huge priority because the one, another way to capture the heart of associates inside a company is to have them volunteer with you. And so it is worthwhile to think about and to offer up with partners or potential funders at home volunteer opportunities and virtual opportunities so that um, you know, so that they can um, they can engage and get to know the nonprofit. And it's really about more than heart, I think, because in some cases employees have amazing skills that they might be marketing or technology experts. All those things that nonprofits are under strain right now because they have so much going on. Absolutely. Um, so is, is this a moment in which we're finally seeing more skilled volunteering versus? Now that we can't go paint a fence or clean a river um, and those kinds of really useful volunteering things. Well, you I, know, we've been seeing it for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. We've been seeing it for a while, a, a shift in the mix. 
Um, sometimes it is, um, it, 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 I think for nonprofits, you're really starting to see them warm up to that as well. <laughs> Yeah. Because it is hard to scope a project to... Yeah. for volunteers to, to give of, of their time. So I think there's a shift on both sides, but shifting that mix has been has been in the um, in the ethos system for a while. Yes. Mark? I just want to add, I, and not a big deal. I think you've said it well, Kevin. But, um, uh, I've often watched people go pick up trash that were tremendous technical skilled people. And I th felt so often that they could be put to better purpose. <laughs> but, but beyond that, honestly, yeah. um, there's an, and this is fascinating because a number of our customers have moved obviously their volunteer programs into virtual volunteer programs. And while it's, it's for some people less engaging, it opens up the aperture to a whole new group of employees they don't have the time to get in the car and spend the afternoon downtown and doing this or that. Or, you know, these are people that can come in, highly skilled, highly skilled employees. They can work on financial aspects or technical aspects of, of the needs for the not-for-profit. Get to know the not-for-profit in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. And these are people that couldn't participate previously that are now part of the program. And I don't think that's going to go away. Mm -hmm. so volunteerism is going to continue forever, and we'll probably add back the other. Uh, fun parts to it, but um, uh, you really need to take advantage of it. I think if I were not the problem, you know, I think that's really important. Yeah. And Stacy, I just wanted to share one of the last things on that slide what was actually one of the first things that CAF America was challenged to do, and that's to modify the application process to streamline the, the application process to make it simpler uh, for charities to be able to qualify and to move money faster and uh, so working with our corporate partners that's exactly what we did and i see there's a question in the chat about um about our our companies loosening the restrictions for reporting and i that's a great I do, question let's talk yeah, about that. <laughs> that is that is part of um of the category ted that ted just described on modifying the application requirements simple more efficient um, there is less of a demand to collect data, but I would caution that the long-term impact may still be that somebody that does report on the data has a better chance of getting the grant again and again and having a long-term partnership. So I think um, I, I think whether or not is it is part of the grant, it behooves an organization still to collect data around outcomes. I, it, and it's data or other, are there other measures of impact that you think companies will want to see now? I think it depends on the corporation. There certainly are a number of corporations that intentionally made grants during this period with the intention of not requiring a lot of reporting. Um, but I think over time, uh, you're likely to see some of that, that, program related uh, grant making come back to where it was before. Uh, but I think it was very healthy during this period of time uh, for corporations to make exceptions and to move money where it was needed most uh, and to move it very fast. And, and I, I, I'm, I, for one, am, am very proud of corporations who made that decision very quickly uh, to make a difference first and to report later. Yeah. I, 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 I... Two things corporations are known for. They're focused on improving efficiency and effectiveness, right? And so from an efficiency standpoint, we want to be responsible in terms of getting the resources to the point of impact with the least amount of friction. The flip side of that is, I don't think the data requests are going to go away. Uh, we, we want to be effective and we want to know we're effective. Every uh, company uh, runs, on, uh, runs on information. And so I suspect that while it's eased for the moment, We'll be back on that phone and trying to get more information about the impact of the, of the gifts. That we I think you're right. So it would, it would really be a mistake to let that down. But what a good thing maybe to get some volunteers to help you with. Um, can we, on that note, can we look at some of the long-term changes? You know, what are some of the things that companies are doing now that you think they're going to stick with? Um, Will we see a move to unrestricted grants, for example, for the long term, or is that just a short term response? I think there's going to be more unrestricted um, giving um, down down the road. Um, I think it's going to be more of a mixture. Uh, I think I think we we certainly uh, the pendulum 
swung in one direction where there uh, was precious little unrestricted uh, giving available. I think we're going to see now a mix, more of a mixture in that regard. Yeah, I think the um, the movement away from typical restrictions may last. I think operational funding, I think some of the modified requirements, those things, I think there is a movement around trust-based philanthropy and um, relying more on the partner to be the expert and allowing the community to make greater, have greater decision-making authority on what, how the money is actually being spent. I think the place where um, it would be hard for me to see a big change would be the grant purpose. So I think it might not be um, restricted money per se, but I do think that the, the alignment of purpose will continue to be an important factor for a corporation working with a nonprofit. And um, it something that makes sense to their, to a corporation's stakeholders like financial literacy and um, and financial services companies or hunger and food companies or education and digital access companies, there still will need to be that alignment because it makes the most sense and it advances all boats. But I do think that some of the other things we're starting to see, it's something I'm absolutely watching for. Um, and I think the next couple of years will be very enlightening around um, around whether or not those things have staying power. How about geography? Are companies giving more locally in response to this? You know, there have been kind of a move away from some of that as companies were nationally centered. Um, they, you know, they focus on something like education rather than the community so much. Um, do you think that this disaster has forced all of us to think more local? If I can jump in, I, I think so. I mean, I think I think there's a there's a you know an improved understanding of the impact of local giving. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think in part that's driven by the employees that are that are being engaged in, in part of that program. I think that um, you know we we also recognize that it really matters what's on the ground. So local giving is really really important. Right, so I think I think we'll see more of that. I, I think it's tied a lot for a lot of corporations to employees, and of course local for a lot of corporations is global mm -hmm. uh, and, and so yeah, uh, that's right. you know and, mm -hmm. and i think you know one of the things that calf america always uh stands for is within the flexibility is solid compliance um and to you know always keep an eye on making sure that there's regulatory compliance within the risk management uh, and I think uh, within that, you can always find some level of flexibility, but corporations need to make sure that the program itself is compliant. Okay. That's really important. Yeah, I, I just, uh, you're, you're, you're right about uh, for corporations, uh, local is global. <laughs> I, think, I think that's absolutely true because there also is a great interest, you know, and, and I realize I'm talking out of both sides here, but there's also a great interest uh, as the communications programs improve uh, you know, employees uh, being being struck by international issues, and so they're they're wanting to reach out uh, globally is, is is another important influence I think on on corporate giving. Stacy, you you had asked about long term changes, and we were talking about employees. I think one of the 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 long term changes that we saw uh, very strong in this uh, uh, in this pandemic are corporations uh, funding employee emergency and hardship relief funds. Yes. Uh, and uh, we saw that very strong uh, in this program, and I think that those will continue to be funded, uh, and uh, uh, that will be a long-term effect of, of this pandemic, I think. Good. Um, and other changes that if you had to look, I'm gonna ask you to go into your crystal ball. Three years from now, how do we see corporate giving being affected by all of these crises? What would you anticipate? Can, can I offer two thoughts? quickly please <laughs> and we're going to come back in three years and hold you to them <laughs> actually a better question is can you stop me right ted you know that's right right, right. <laughs> so two thoughts quickly i think we're finding uh, two things uh one is that the sort of sort of a combination of things that are happening in corporations so 
um, you know, it, it will be very, very normal for us to have employees that both volunteer, uh, give money to not for profits, and then corporations come around with some sort of a grant, and that grant could be some sort of an in-kind opportunity, mm -hmm. or it can be actual financial support. I think you're going to see, you know, a variety of corporate resources. If you look back at the statement that was made in the roundtable, um, was it earlier this year or the end of last year? I can't remember. But they want to bring all of their resources uh, to bear on. on Can you remind business. people about the business roundtable? What they said? Yeah, yeah. they they yeah. said that uh, they said that you know I think I think it, it, it's an acknowledgement that that uh, it's not so much uh, corporations are no longer about purely uh, shareholders and profits, but they're about stakeholders and imp improving a lot for all constituents that leads to a more and uh, a better community, which in turn rises the tides for all. Uh, uh, you know, for profits included. So, for example, so th that recognition is let's bring more resources to the to the opportunity. And so you see a bunch of combinations of things happening. They're not just grants or employee giving, but some combination of those things, including in kind and, and in time and so on. The last thing that was the bot in that last slide. If you could pull that last slide up for a second, I just want to. This is this is really something, and they're they're related but different. Can you pull that last slide up for a second? Nope. Okay. Um, well, in the bottom left-hand side of that, you'll notice that corporations are going to have their philanthropic intent colored by social, by their social justice concerns, right? Racial. There, there you are, Mark. So, there you bottom left-hand corner. We have gotten a tremendous request for information about not-for-profit uh, diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. They want to know that the people that they're working with are sensitive to this issue, and if we're going to give resources to you, time, money, product you know, so on. We want to know that we're all on the same page. So I think that's going to be uh, something that, that uh, appropriately influences uh, corporate giving over the coming years. I think that's a really important point. And are they looking at the boards as well as the leadership, everything across the board? And There's no limit to the amount of information that they're <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's right. Yeah. Stacy, I think one of the lessons learned, I, I think the corporations got right, but they're glad that they got it right, is that uh, right now where we are is they haven't given all their money. Mm -hmm. They still have money that they can give. Um, and that's a good thing because as Carolyn mentioned earlier, we're coming into disaster season. So we're, we're still in a pandemic. Um, we have an uncertain economy. Uh, we're coming into disaster season. So even though corporations gave generously last year, uh, gave uh, higher amounts during the pandemic, they, they planned ahead to have a little bit more that they could give uh, so that they would have funds available knowing that there would be additional needs and they wouldn't have to say there's nothing left. Yeah. Uh, and I think that planning ahead, um, sir, it will serve uh, employees and their communities very well. Uh, and I think that corporations looking back will realize that was a smart move. And in the future, that's going to become part of their game plan. Well, I also think, and this is not um, often said, I do think that it, it is important to remember that corporations are coming off a, a windfall in terms of tax relief last year. And so an increase and a planned increase this <laughs> year you know, it it is it, it is as unlucky as can be, but at least um, the timing of a pandemic is at a time when many corporations could afford to increase their budgets, and so I think um, I think in those ways it, it you know it it's helped to lift this year, and even when we see the trends for next year, which you're not there yet, even when you see the trends. Uh, for next year, any decreases or flat budgets are on top of the 2020 increased giving. So, if, you know, if 75% increased their giving this year by somewhere between one and 50%, then, um, and, and in next year there is maybe a decrease, but not, not that much, then it's still higher than it was in 2019. Yeah, and two thirds so are going to maintain. Well. And Carolyn, two thirds are going to maintain or increase their giving right. off from those higher levels. Higher. So that's that's significant. Right. There is the higher levels. Yeah. Um, I also think when I 
think about the future. I think the employee voice will be more and more important. Um, I think capacity building as a strategy for small to mid-sized organizations, especially those led by people of color, will be an important shift. Um, I know there is a financial services company in Baltimore that um, has been investing since uh, the Freddie Gray incident five years ago, but has continued to invest and is, and is investing even more so in the capacity building of, of organizations of the community, because I think that, that corporations understand why the strength of these organizations is so important. So I think that's another trend that we will look back on in, in three years and see. And I think the last one that I would suggest is that companies really like to bring their ingenuity to the table and not just their money. And they pride themselves on solving problems. They, they do it pretty well. And so I, I think they are more and more going to take issues that are important to their company, but also to the community. And they're gonna really do some hard work on solving things. So they'll get not just the philanthropy people and the volunteerism people involved, and not just the employee resource groups, but the product developers, you know, the hard business folks that are going to rally around issues because the stakeholders are no longer just Wall Street, right. um, you know, and their employees and their customers, the stakeholder group has really changed as environmental social and government issues, ESG, have risen to the top of, of the next generation's uh, mind. And I'm really glad you mentioned that because of course, we haven't talked about climate change in this conversation, but that is clearly another huge thing that is coming at us and we need all that ingenuity coming. Exactly. I, I can imagine that there are probably a lot of questions coming in. We, we um, do, Stacy, and I can uh, start asking some of those if you'd like me to. I'd love that. Uh, first question here um, is, I'm curious, we have switched our in-person events to virtual one. We rely on corporations for sponsorships, yet many have come back and said that they're not sponsoring any events now or in the near future. Are corporations giving to general support? I mean, Mark, yes. you, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can do it. You could do it. Ted, yeah, you absolutely. Do it. I mean, uh, I, well, I'll let you jump in here, but absolutely. If they're giving the general support, in fact, they broaden their, their, their interest to be able to do that. Um, you're right that there's a step back on events for some obvious reasons, not thinking at the time about, about uh, virtual events. Uh, so, so I think you got to be a little creative, make sure you're, you're, you're calling in the, you know, the things that, that, that will get their attention, but yeah, there's a definite broadening of purpose for uh, corporations to give to not for profits for general purpose, no question about it. Carol, please, please add. Yeah, and I think the most important thing that a nonprofit can do when they are talking with a corporation is ask what is important to you, the corporation. Mm -hmm. I think the first question really is what's important to you and what's important to your employees? Why do you care about the issues that you care about? And in so doing, you can pivot, excuse the word, away from an, an event sponsorship and into, you know, it gets your juices going on. What do I do that they need or do they care about? Where's the common caring and interest? And I think, I think that's that the pivoting. most important thing. It's that, that pivoting to a different mindset. And I think for a lot of nonprofits, that's tough when you've always thought about your next gala, your next special event, yeah. and that's how you fund yourself, mm -hmm. thinking in terms of how you fund yourself on an operational basis is a different mindset, and it's a, and it's a pivot uh, that you mm -hmm. have to make a change to. Uh, Stacy, next, uh, next question. The, sort of a broad question here, I think, for, for, for all of you here. Have corporate matching gift programs for virtual volunteering hours been successful and or increased during COVID? Have employers modified their requirements so employees can get their volunteering matched hour by hour versus having to meet a minimum of certain number of hour volunteer hours before they can get match funds for their time? So sort of the old model to the new model and how does all of this work? Mark, this is sort of the world you live in. Yeah. yeah. How is all this working? That's a very, very specific question. So I'd love to find out uh, which program they're talking about. But uh, 
you know, I, you know, it's hard to it's hard to talk about general approach to corporations. But I can tell you one thing: generally, uh, the corporations have lowered the overall threshold thresholds to get matches. Uh, period. So, uh, as part of uh, Bank of America's commitment to this, uh, they lowered their overall matching program uh, and and did, did and, and increased the amount that an employee can donate that will be matched. So, in general, they're expanding the the access to that. And since a lot of in-person volunteering has has gone understandably to the side, uh, there are plenty of uh, what we call dollar for doers or, or volunteer matching gifts. Uh, that are that are happening out there, and there are uh, all kinds of different thresholds. Um, but but generally speaking, corporations over time have lowered the 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 bar you have to jump over in order to get uh, to the to the next level of support. As as a general sense, Carolyn, are you seeing much uh, discussion of that within your membership? I I think that um, it it is difficult for to to have the quality of vir of virtual volunteering than in person volunteering. And so people in our roles are struggling with the virtual volunteer roles. And so it, they understand that they can't ding an employee if they're not providing a great match opportunity. Um, but what I have seen is that they, people are starting to change what they'll match. So let's say they're doing a campaign instead of just hour for hour volunteering but it's more like a communications campaign. And for every email or for every social media post, um, you know, we'll make a match to an organization of your choice. So I think what the match is for is starting to expand. And I think organizations approaching corporations can get creative with, with some of those asks. Uh, so it's not just about an hour of volunteering. Mm -hmm. Stacey, um, we do have other questions, but I don't want to step on uh, yeah, any questions or direction you want to go let's in. Let's let the audience, uh, they've got great questions. Let's keep okay. going. Capacity building for nonprofits yeah. led by people of color is so important. Is there funding or mentorship opportunities available for this? Is this a growing area that you're aware of? I think so. I mean, I what I have heard um, from our members and um, Specifically in, in Baltimore, the organization that is doing that is T. Rowe Price. Um, but, but I do think that, um, that the sustainability of small organizations led by people of color is something that all corporations understand is vital for the interests of the entire community. And therefore, as they think about you know, what's the most important thing to fund, making sure that those organizations are still around tomorrow and next year and the next year is really important to them. And that's why I think the capacity building piece will grow um, over time because the sustainability of nonprofits is so threatened in this environment. I, I, just to add to that, I mean, I totally, totally agree. And the financial services companies have been very active. I'm going to develop a list of of other company programs in my mind so I can remember. But here again, uh, Bank of America, very publicly committed a billion dollars over four years, focused on improving um, uh, social, social justice issues. And recently, you know, publicly, you know, uh, announced, uh, started granting, I think 300 million of that, targeted in a variety of ways to develop uh, uh, capacity in, in, you know, minority uh, run not for profits and other capabilities. So I think, it, I think it's being done. And, and while I don't conjure up a list in my head right now, I, I'll make sure I can next time, but it's, it's happening all over. Stacey, this next question might actually go to you first from your vantage point at the, the Chronicle um, about co companies that currently do not have a robust CSR or corporate giving program. Does the current climate with COVID social justice disaster relief force companies to focus more, more on CSR if they've never done it previously. So from the Chronicle's perspective, are you seeing forces move companies in a CSR direction or move away from a CSR direction? Yeah, I would say especially the social justice movement has really prompted a lot of companies, regardless of what they do, um, to think about jumping in and, you know, I, I would say that's in part because they know their employees, they know their customers, mm -hmm. they know it really, they can't keep operating without, I mean, some of it's their social conscious, but it's also, a, that's why I think people see this as a really amazing moment. 
um, in which we can capture that. So yeah, we've seen an enormous number of companies, they haven't even always figured out exactly what they want to do. And they make a big announcement saying, you know, it's X zillion dollars that's being committed to this. And then we say, well, what are you going to do with it? Like, I don't know, but we're going to do something. Um, that's how ready they are to jump in. So I think that broadening of more companies getting involved is really important. The flip side is, and I wonder maybe if the panelists want to talk about this, obviously the companies that are probably responding to these surveys are the ones that are relatively healthier, that their businesses are doing well um, in this environment, a technology company, for example. What about, you know, let's just say the airlines, you know, what about the companies that you know, are laying off large numbers of employees. Um, what do we think is going to happen with their sense of social responsibility? Uh, I, I can add that we work with, with um, you know, a number of uh, travel and entertainment businesses um, and um, uh, specifically airlines. And, uh, you know, it, sure, they're, 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 first of all, they're looking for partnership by people that are contributing to them. And so, so you know, we're certainly happy to do that. But secondly, in at least one case, they're expanding uh, the, the opportunity for their employees to give. Mm. They're not pulling back on their programs. Um, certainly, these companies, in some cases, have, have had furlough programs, uh, you know, for their business, um, you know, continuity. Uh, but those employees that continue to be involved um, have all the opportunities that they've had before. Uh, I don't know how long that will continue. I think I think there's some worry as we move into the fourth quarter. You know, I. You know, now we've been all in it for a while, so it sort of seems, I'm so tired of saying the new normal, but it feels like, <laughs> you know, um, and I think we're going to be in this for a little while more, uh, you know, lots of talk about vaccines and so on, but, uh, you know, the question is, as we move into the fourth quarter, what's going to happen from there? Um, but, I, you know, travel and entertainment businesses that we're working with, yeah, they're struggling, but they're still- But they're uh, still giving. Still committed to participating, and their employees uh, still feel lucky to have an opportunity to contribute as well. I think employee relief is really important there. So companies that are struggling have dedicated m much of their philanthropic resources to laid off employees mm -hmm. and to community-based organizations that will directly serve employees where there are lots of cuts. Um, I have heard from two different organizations, um, one in mining and one in uh, entertainment and, and media who have had really terrible economic consequences from, from the recession, who have said that one of the challenges for them is a message that sits side by side with a message of, we're cutting salaries, we're laying people off. And so when there are messages that at the same time say, we're giving X million dollars to the community and your salary is being cut by 20%, you know, it, sometimes the message is as clear as then why can't I get the tax relief for that? <laughs> so I think with companies that are struggling, there is a, a tightrope on what's the best way to manage these messages and how can we assure our stakeholders that we, when we emerge from this, this infrastructure that we've built will not go away because community is so important to us. Really Casey, cool. again, I think going back to your uh, platform at the, at the Chronicle, um, a global pandemic is international in nature. Uh, has, is there a shift to supporting international charities and the international nature of a global pandemic? You know, I think we've seen kind of mixed re responses on that, and it obviously depends where it's coming from. Certainly the private foundations, um, Gates, Welcome Trust, you know, those that operate in that way have been putting a lot of money into research and science and those kinds of things. Um, still deep concerns, though, about, you know, what is happening to Africa? Are enough people giving and aware of those challenges? The nonprofits that are working on international relief are really struggling um, because it, there's an inadequate health care to begin with. Um, and so the needs there are vast. Um, so, you know, I would say I, I see some promising signs, certainly of philanthropists raising the consciousness of it, but 
I, I think that's the hard part about this whole thing is the needs are so vast everywhere um, that trying to figure out, I, there, I've not heard anybody say there is enough <laughs> being given enough, for, for yeah, any cause given. yet. Um, right. And, you know, I think that's why this is going to be so urgent for every, and that's why I'm glad companies are holding back ready to give some more uh, because these needs are going to be ongoing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Stacy, there's more questions, but probably not more time. So um, <laughs> we, uh, on behalf of CAF America, I want to thank you uh, and uh, Mark and Carolyn for just an incredible panel. Uh, for the Chronicle uh, to uh, uh, host us today. Uh, this has just really been incredible. So thank you very much. Thank all of you. What a great conversation. Yeah, me too. Ted, congratulations to Cap America on a great series of studies. This is the last, I think, of, of four. Is it yeah, there's four and, uh, and volume five will be coming out in a few weeks. So uh, uh, volume six is already in the planning stages. So uh, uh, thank you all for your, your support of our, of our research. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you all panelists and the Chronicle for being wonderful partners to us. And we look forward to collaborating in the future. We absolutely will. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.